Okay. Eh, lavori da qua allora? Sì, c'è il laser pointer. Okay. So, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, my name is Pedro. I am working at, well, let me position myself properly. I'm working at uh, Utrecht University as a postdoc and I'm here to give you your first uh, lecture introducing you to the machinery behind many body perturbation theory. Okay. I think there's a warning. No, okay. All right, so this is the schematic of what I'm going to be talking about. So first of all, is a short introduction to the many body problem within quantum mechanics. Then we will uh, try to move into Green's function, its definition and properties, so how to extract uh, information from the Green's function. Then we will talk about how to compute it using Nysen's equation, and I will give you a short preview of what you'll be seeing during the school. All right, here seems to be the best place. So the many body problem within quantum mechanics. As Andrea showed you uh, in the last lecture, the problem uh, is that we need to diagonalize and obtain the eigenstates and eigenvalues for this Hamiltonian, which is, well, the basic uh, of quantum mechanics. Now, this is made of, uh, we can describe it in two parts, so we can think of it as uh, having a term that has all the single particle elements, either the kinetic energy or its interaction with an external potential, like an electromagnetic field, but then you have the rather complicated piece that deals with the particle interactions. And this is the problem that we will try to solve. Now, if you can think of it as uh, that the first many body problem was actually the gravity, the introduction of the three body problem, and you might think that with advancements in mathematics and physics, it, things became easier to solve, but in fact, no. And right now, even having no particles, so the electromagnetic vacuum, is uh, something that is uh, quite difficult to treat. However, there are tricks to go around this. So the first thing is that we, can, we have to consider what's going on. So the one particle, or the single particle Hamiltonian, you, I quite like this picture, and you can find in Matuk that you can see it as a horse, an isolated horse that runs through a field. But the field is not empty, it's not a horse in vacuum with a frictionless uh, you know, surface, otherwise the horse won't run and it also will not breathe. You also need to consider whoops, what is going on. So the horse will move around and as it goes it creates a cloud of dust around it think, due to its interaction with the field. And maybe some flies as well, thanks to the smell. And so it's this effect at we will be discussing during the school the concept of quasi-particle. So not just the electron itself or the hole itself, but also the effects of the surrounding electrons and holes that are in the material. And as in all cases, you have to consider that there are two limiting possibilities. One would be the ideal solution that you are fully able to you know, solve your Hamiltonian, you have all the interactions, but this is uh, often quite costly, especially for realistic materials. So you'll, it'll be very hard to reach this point. But you can also not stay at the full isolated particle case. So we need to find a compromise, something that sits in between these two limiting uh, situations. And we have to discuss uh, you will have always to consider how feasible it is and how accurate, so how distant it is from the most easy to solve case or how, long, how distant it is from the uh, exact solution that you are very hard to ever reach, that it's going to be very hard to ever reach. Now, uh, some of you might be familiar with it and a common uh, approach is based on density functional theory. So all quantities are assumed to be uh, expressed as a function of the ground state density. And then you work trying to solve the Kronstrom system of equations for a system of independent uh, quasi-electrons. And you have the fundamental object that describes the interaction as the Kronstrom potential. However, as some of you might know, and probably the reason why you're at this school, 
DFT is quite good for ground state properties, but it's made for the ground state. It's not made to access excited state uh, information or, for, or even non-equilibrium uh, information. And a fish is very good at swimming, but you cannot ask it to climb a tree. So you need something else. And one of the examples of the failure of DFT quite often is given as the gap that uh, we, all, we can compute the band structure and it's going to be quite nice uh, reproducing the dispersion of the bands, but the gap is often uh, incorrect and we need something else to go beyond it. And it's often GW that you'll see, uh, I think tomorrow, if I'm not wrong. Now, oop. what happened in the previous slide? So why is DFT failing and why do we need to go beyond? Well, the gap is not exactly a single particle property. When you theoretically think of the gap, you're thinking about removing an electron from a system that has n particles and then putting it back into the conduction. And so within DFT, going into uh, and the approximation was too far and we need to come back and be closer to the realistic system and reintroduce some of the interactions between the particles that we are completely neglecting with TFT. Especially because if you think about it, the, electric, uh, the electronic gap and optical absorption are not just, as I said, uh, single electron uh, phenomena. You need to consider what's going to happen, how the system will react once this electron is removed uh, from the valence into conduction. So, the electrons are not static, they're not frozen. They see each other, they interact with each other. And once an electron is removed, it leaves behind a hole, which polarizes your material and all the other electrons are going to see this hole and they will try to react to it. And this is what DFT, DFT neglects quite often. Come on. So this is the general problem. So we have talked about how uh, the issue that we have a lot of particles in the system and it's not often feasible to compute and to solve the Hamiltonian exactly. The FT is quite good for the ground state, but we want to go beyond. We want to reach uh, and compute accurate band gaps and often optical phenomena. Now, a, a way to do this is based on the Green's function that I will talk about now. So, Consider this, if you have a solid and at a certain point you have an electron in RT and then it propagates and reaches the position R prime T prime, you can think, you can try to visualize the transition uh, matrix element. So you are at the beginning at the ground state, then an electron is created at R propagated from T to T prime, reaching finally R prime, and then you close the, the expression to obtain the matrix transition element. This brings, is how you describe the movement of the electron going from here to here, and you can think of it as the electron, electron Green's function. You can also think of a particle going uh, the other way, and this would be the hole, which motivates also the expression for the Hall's, Hall's green function. So, but now instead of creating an electron, you're destroying a state because the hole is the absence of an electron, so to say, that moves backwards in time. Now, all of this, okay, someone already did something on Saturday. <laughs> all of this, motivates the expression for the time order Green's function, which will be uh, the fundamental object for this uh, lecture. That is written in this way, where here you have a time ordering operator that uh, allows you to replace, <coughs> or better to simplify this uh, expression here involving the electron and the whole Green's function. Now, what can you extract from the Green's function? Much like we said in DFT, you, where you assume that all quantities are functional of the density, and if you know how to write it, and if you have the density of the ground state, you can extract every, all the information that you need. Similar thing happens in the Green's function. So you have a sort of general expression for the average value of an operator, 
which in the case of the density is quite easy to write because it's just a diagonal part. But there's more information hidden inside the structure of the Green's function. So for instance, if we look at its poles, and we do this by inserting a completeness, uh, completeness relation between uh, a system of n plus one or n minus one particles, we can arrive at what is called the lemon representation of the Green's function. Once also you take the Fourier transform with respect to t minus t prime. Now what's hidden inside here, though it looks uh, rather complicated, there is uh, easy information to extract already. So first off, you have the excitation energies here between the, in the system of n minus one and n, n plus one and n minus one particles. They are uh, limit, they are uh, separated by the chemical potential. So the energy needed to either add a particle or remove a particle. And here you have some uh, matrix elements that will give you the amplitudes. But once you plot this on the imaginary axis, you see that from the poles of the Green's function, you can actually access the excitation energies of your system. So not only you have information of the average value of operators, you also have information on excitation energies of your system, something that DFT was not providing uh, immediately. Now, everything I've told you works and it's true, but there is a fundamental issue, is that I'm telling you that once you know the solution, so once you know the ground state, you can get all the information about the ground state. The problem is uh, then how do you actually get the ground state? Because it's not uh, useful if I'm telling you that you need to know the solution in order to know the solution. It's somewhat tautological. And this is what we are going to discuss with Dyson's equation. So how to actually compute and evaluate the Green's function. So first of all, we start from the time order expression for the Green's function. And we have to assume that at some point there is a, a ground state, a system that you can actually solve for which you know the solution. And the interaction is given by this uh, operator V that you're able to tune adiabatically. So at some point in the very far past, you know where the system was, you know the ground state, and in the late future, you also assume that it's going to go back to it. But at the time that you are somewhat performing your measurement, you're able to adiabatically bring the system to the fully interacting one. And I have a new Hamiltonian that has a new state. Now, how do we connect this uh, two uh, sets, so the ground state Hamiltonian and the fully interacting Hamiltonian? Well, at, at uh, zero Kelvin, so at zero temperature uh, Green's function, there's an actual theorem or a mathematical trick, mo most uh, accurately, that can connect both. So it tells you that as long as this limit exists, this will be an eigenstate of your fully interacting uh, Hamiltonian. So you don't need to worry about um, evaluating these matrix elements here, because as long as you're able to show, and it's quite often possible that uh, this el element, this, sorry, this limit exists, then it's fine. You can connect the non-interacting system with the fully interacting one. This, however, does not quite simplify your life because the expression for the Green's function becomes somewhat more complicated. So you have an infinite sum of uh, products of the put interaction potential and we want to simplify this. So a way to, or, or, or by the D way, and it's a very nice result from mathematics, to sort out this uh, time order product, it's to use Wick's theorem that replaces the time ordering product as a sum of the normal ordering of all, uh, <clears throat> of all operators, plus the normal ordering with one contraction between two operators, normal ordering uh, with two contractions of operators, and so on and so forth until everything is contracted. What is a contraction? So it's simply a difference between the time ordering and the normal ordering of two operators. So it means that you have all um, annihilation operators 
to the right and all creation operators to the left if I'm not switching right and left, which I often do. And luckily, the expectation value of, the, of a contraction is simply the expectation value of the time ordering operator. Now, once you manipulate this very uh, nasty looking expression here, you're actually able to arrive at a simplified version of the Green's function that will give you all them diagrammatic uh, expressions and all contributions to G. Now, the fundamental idea that Vick's theorem tries to, oops, moving too fast, that Vick's theorem tries to um, do is that instead of dealing with this very complicated uh, step, you replace all your processes, and this is what exactly the Feynman diagrams are doing, you replace this one step uh, complicated process with a sum over steps of much simpler processes. And this is an analogy I made that, well, think of it as, a, hmm, it's quite difficult. Think of it as a, a somewhat ideal or idealized experiment where you have a, a ball going th through a black box and it's repeatedly bombarded with jets of ink. And the only thing you know is that it comes out blue. Now instead, you, instead of dealing with all the bombardments at the same time of ink, you simply say, okay, let's deal with it as uh, iterative steps. The first thing that happens is that the ball, which was white, is just hit by blue ink and comes out as blue. And then, you can consider that it's first hit by red ink, then blue ink, and comes out as blue, and more complicated processes, and so on and so forth. And if you sum all the probabilities of this uh, hits by ink, the idea between uh, Vick's theorem is that the sum of all of this has to be equal to what's happening inside the black box that is very hard to describe and that you don't know how to deal with. So instead of just doing the full complicated thing, you just start dividing the problem. First you do one transition, then two transitions, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and ideally at the end the full sum would be equal to the entire process. Oops. And so this is what you're trying to do when you're doing the Eisen's equation or when you want to arrive at Eisen's equation more actually. So here we have the first order contributions for the Green's function with the Coulomb potential and you have all the, all the six terms. And now we can start trying to correlate them with diagrams. So how does this work? This is also an important part because for the rest of the school you're going to see lots of images with lines, wigglies, bubbles going on and so forth, and you cannot just stare at it as if they were hieroglyphs. You actually have to have a somewhat a Rosetta Stone. So let's concentrate on expressions A and B. If I can move the slides forward, all right. So first off, you have an independent particle Green's function going from one to two, which are also the limits of uh, your, uh, your uh, term for the fully interacting. So it's basically free, not interacting with anything. And you have Green's functions going from three to three and four to four that interact with the Coulomb potential. So this is the equivalent expression, the equivalent diagram of this a, a contribution. For the B contribution, it's almost the same. So you have an isolated line, but now you have two lines connecting the extrema of the potential. And these two types of diagrams are what we call disconnected diagrams because, well, you have the, <coughs> you have a green, you have two pieces that are not connected by any line. Now, once we look at the other four contributions, we will see that not all of them are uh, different from each other. So starting with contribution C, we can understand that there is a Green's function going from one to three, three to four, and four to two. So you can draw it as a straight line already with two points that are then connected by the potential. 
for term D, however, you have it going from one to three, three to two, so already reaching the final point of your integration. But then there is a Green's function that connects uh, the twice to the, one of the vertices of the potential. Now, these are the two main contributions because if we look at expression E, we see that instead of three, we have the coordinate four, and instead of four, we have coordinate three. So we have just flipped, and you obtain a diagram that is equivalent to contribution C, and the same happens to F and D. So even in your expression or the correction of the Green's function, not all diagrams are going to be different. Some of them are going to be topologically equivalent to each other, and this is something you have to take into account. So you are only going to need the diagrams that are topologically different when you're dealing with uh, whatever system you're studying. Now, as I mentioned before, we have two types of diagrams, two that are disconnected and two that are fully connected. And thankfully, you can actually prove that the Green's function can be written in this way. So you have the product of all connected diagrams with all the disconnected diagrams divided by all the disconnected diagrams. So you can just cancel out and ignore completely the disconnected diagrams and you only need to consider the ones, those that are connected. And once you do it, you arrive at this uh, expression for the Green's function. Now, the fully interacting one written in this way with the double line that uh, starts to resemble something like this. And you can notice that uh, there are, there's also another distinct, uh, distinction between the diagrams. First is that you have diagrams that cannot be split by uh, cutting through a Green's function line and still leave you with uh, a, G, a diagram for the Green's function that are these three, well, these two, you can cut through this Green's function line here and still obtain a diagram. So to the first kind, we call irreducible diagrams because there is no way to cut them through a Green's function line and still obtain a Green's function diagram, while the later are called reducible because you can actually do it. But not only this, if, even if you were to write you organize your sum as the sum of all irreducible diagrams as a building block, and here I'm taking just this diagram as an example, you will start to notice that the equation is somewhat repeating itself. So this term is repeating this one here, and then the next terms are also repeating the equation. And this means that you can Re reorganize all your sum of diagrams, cutting through this line here, and take advantage of the repeating terms and write them in this way, so that your <coughs> fully interacting Green's function is the non-interacting Green's function times the non-interacting Green's functions multiplied by the sum of all irreducible diagrams that don't repeat, and again, the same equation. And this is the diagrammatic motivation for the Dyson equation as we're using the reducible self-energy that is uh, written mathematically in this, uh, in this form. Now, this is not enough, uh, unfortunately, you, because the self-energy is also uh, an equation. So you actually here, you're going to have, oops, an integral differential equation because the self-energy is also made a uh, function of the Green's function. So you need to close the system of, of equations. So we have one, the equation for the Green's function, but now we need the equation for the self-energy that deals with the interaction. So this boson W here and the recombination uh, with, through the vertex you also need to be able to describe, so all of this, just a short note, is made for the Coulomb potential. You also need to be able to describe how the boson uh, is computed. So we, uh, in this case, we do it by the screening. 
we also uh, are going to need to understand how electrons and holes are interacting or not in your system. This is done via the polarizability. And finally, you have the last equation that closes everything, which is the vertex. And this is called hidden system of uh, equations. So it's a, together with the equation of motion for G is a system of five equations that if you are uh, able to solve them, they would give you the full solution for your problem. It's usually represented in this way with the pentagram. And the idea is that you start from one, of, one point and you then go on iterating through all of them until your, your solution is converged. Now, this is the full machinery, or, or better, the introduction to the full machinery. What comes next? And what are you going to see in the next lectures during the, the week? So, depending on your system and depending on what you're studying, well, you'll have to consider which diagrams are important, which are the ones that you're going to have to include in your sum, which are the ones that you can disregard. And this will be based on the physics of your system. So if you're studying interaction with electromagnetic fields, or if you're studying phonons, or if you're studying um, magnons, plasmons, whatever it is, you, you are going to have to adapt your, uh, your form formulation of the problem to the exact interaction that you want to describe. And this, you need to understand the physics of the system, and it's what's going to be explained to you in the next uh, days. So things like interaction range, conserve quantities, a low high density limit of the, of the electrons, all of this will have to be taken into account when, if you want to do a proper ac uh, accurate description of your system. So for instance, one of the things that you're going to deal with in the next uh, days is the accurate computation of the, band, of the electronic band gap. So you'll move from DFT into the correction of the band gap using GW, but then once you reach optical absorption, you'll see that GW is actually not good enough. You need to go beyond and reach the level of the beta subitary equation to actually uh, accurately describe the interaction between the electrons and the, the electron and the whole pair that will give you the optical gap, which is what you actually measure in absorption experiments. And this is where I conclude. If you want to know more, especially since I uh, glossed over a lot of details, this is what we usually call the Fetra Valetska in f 20 to 40 minutes <laughs> lecture. And this is a massive book with, uh, well, uh, with lots of uh, theory and mathematical derivations. You can also find a more didactic approach in Matuk and uh, other uh, ways to derive these equations using Strinatis uh, with the fun functional derivative uh, method. And you also have uh, some sort of, um, let's call it Bible, that encompasses all theory, so not just uh, what I've shown you, which is the zero uh, temperature formalism, but also out the way up to the non-equilibrium formalism where the, the system is no longer in the ground state. You're creating something that uh, is already somewhat out of equilibrium and you need to deal with, it spe uh, with uh, some special care using what Andrea mentioned, which is the Keldish contour. So thank you all for your attention. and. Questions? Okay, Just why there is a, a question from a student. So which book do you prefer? Uh, depends. Let's put it this way. Uh, if I knew nothing and wanted a complete mathematical derivation of everything, Fetter. If uh, I wanted something that uh, at the start doesn't really have a lot of physical considerations, but because uh, the functional derivative technique is a mathematical trick, then uh, Strinati. If you already know this too, and you will want to learn a lot about physics, you can read Abrikozov's book, uh, but this is written in Landauwish. Yes. <laughs> So it's the, the books you read after you know the subject. 
So you once you understand what's going on, you read them to have a deeper insight on, on physics. <laughs> Hello, uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, so you said that uh, we need uh, this many body formalism to find the gap. Mm -hmm. uh, so suppose if you have an exact exchange correlation, do we need to still use these uh, many body methods to compute the gap? Because as you said, you can't compute gap with DFT. What would you call the exact exchange correlation I mean, function? Suppose we have like a, a method which can give a, a good approximation, good approximation for exchange correlation. And uh, the question is now, does this work for all materials? Yes, hypothetically, let's Hypothet assume that. So hypothetically, this is the ideal case of DFT. Yeah. Good luck finding it. <laughs> Uh, I mean, like, uh, as I understood, I mean, you can't compute gap uh, with a DFT. I mean, mm -hmm. as far as I understood, this is because uh, we are using some approximations, for example, LDA. Yeah, yeah, no, the point is that you have to understand what is the theory developed for. So yeah. in DFT, even if I give you the exact potential, you can calculate exactly only the density. Yeah. Only the density and the total, total energy. energy, of course, because it's a functional of the density. But in, in the FT, the corner sharp equations are nothing more than a, a Lagrange multiplier equations. So you do functional derivative, uh, sorry, um, a minimization as you do with artery fog. Exactly the same with, uh, with exact energy functional. And then you can prove exactly that you can rewrite the density in, in a single particle representation. Exactly as it is artery fog. But instead of artery fog wave function, you have corner sham wave function. But the energies as the Lagrange multipliers that ensure autonormalization of the wave function, they have no physical meaning except for the lowest excitations, the Kupman's theorem. But this is another story. In general, you cannot interpret the corner sham levels as gaps. And in DFT, this is pretty known. Actually, mm -hmm. It has been also demonstrated that even the exact Gondesham gap misses of a piece, that is uh, the, the, the derivative discontinuity terms, it is due to the fact that if you do the theory instead that from the density, from the total energies, you say, okay, forget about densities. I still exact exchange correlation potential. And then you try to do the same story with the total energies. You realize that when you add an electron, the potential and the density change so abruptly that you have another piece that is completely missing Konishan. So it's a different theory. While many body in, instead is, is developed exactly to give the poles of the single part of Green's function and then the gap. So with the exact self energy instead, you get the exact gap, exact. I mean, it's not that uh, we are not able to get the exact gap with DFT, but this is somewhat a uh, trick. We can use hybrid functionals, DFT plus U, and so on and so on, but it's not an ex it won't be an exact theory, it won't be the exact functional ever. And you, you can do it there. It won't be general, it won't apply to all systems, and some hybrid functionals are extremely nasty to deal with computationally. So, the as Andreas said, the point is that DFT is not made for this. It's not made to get the band gap ever. You can trick it. You can manipulate the functional as much as you want. But it's, it, it won't be a general uh, framework. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, uh, this, comp uh, this many body formulation uh, how many parameters are involved, for instance? That's the first question. Uh, for instance, if you have a system, you have different systems, and um, does it mean that? What's that? I don't know. So the number of parameters yes, are needed. One second. 
the number of parameters involved, are they the same or we have to go through many parameters for different systems? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So that's just the first question. And uh, when, because, okay, the uh, computation of uh, quantities, okay, we are talking about. Um, so, a uh, couple of things. Uh, So we're talking about the computation of the exact band gaps. Well, I remember one time I was calculating one particular system, which is, uh, it doesn't involve the calculation of exact band gap, but it involves the calculation of the difference in the band gap. I'm not interested in the, the exact, but I'm interested in the, the difference in the band gap. But the question is, do I need to go to these uh, higher level calculation in order to, to do my calculation, but or DFT is just enough. Okay, so the number of parameters, this is dependent on how you write it. Um, you can do, tight, for instance, tight biting DFT, which is going to be dependent on a series of parameters. You can do some sort of semi-empirical method, which is also going to be dependent on lots of parameters. You can do what we do, which is to take uh, DFT as the starting point, and then the only parameters you actually need are the chemical composition and the geometry of your system. So it's what we call ab initio. The idea is that you just need to know what's there and how it's arranged, and this from this, you can extract all information. But this is a philosophy, uh, I don't know, approach to, to the problem. So it, you have to choose what will be the, the best. So just let me stress, uh, what Pedro is saying is that uh, ab initio many body perturbation theory is a parameter free simulation. So you don't have to feed it with, without, with any parameter, this is yep. one point. But then of course, there are the parameters that you need to converge. So there is the energy cutoff, the number of bands, and in this yes. sense, uh, there are many parameters that you need uh, to converge, so. Yes, but those are not fitted to anything experimental. Yeah, not, These yeah. are uh, the same thing as you do in numerical integration. You have to converge your integrals. Uh, for the, your second question, I'm not sure I understood it. So you want, you're interested in the difference of gaps of systems? Uh, what is this band alignment case? Well, yeah, you still need to go to, to GW in, because the, there is no in guarantee that the difference of the gaps from DFT is going to, is going to be accurate. Yeah, yeah, we need for one particular system, for instance, um, I'm not even sure, it's a possible system, think, think of size. So we know if think of size, you know that uh, DFT I mean, I mean, if it's for one particular system, it might, it might happen, it might happen, uh, but we cannot guarantee you that it will happen for all systems. Imagine that you have, um, uh, let's say, HBN and uh, transition metal like alcogenide. Uh, the correction uh, for the gap for uh, the transition metal like alcogenide is of the order of the one electron volt, which is enormous compared to the FT, and this is similar of magnitude for HBN. So if you are building an interface of this, it means that uh, your DFT calculation difference between the gaps is not going to, to be good, I would say. But, but I mean, the, it, it's clear. It's clear. I mean, uh, the, 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 it is absolutely uh, clear also to us that the, the, the procedure, I mean, the, the work you have to do from the many body to the final number is huge. And uh, I mean, it is not the only way. There are many other ways with empirical methods, intuition. There is different ways to do physics, millions of ways mm -hmm. to do physics. So absolutely, our message is not that you have to be strict and formal from the beginning to the, beginning to the end. It is something that must be decided, decided on the basis of the project, or of the problem, of the system. There are so many ingredients. But uh, more you are aware of what you can use, the more you can decide which mm -hmm. one to use. Yeah. 
You have to fit the solution to the problem you're studying and to the resources you have. This Something is, we're going to discuss. But this is the human and logistic limitation of it. So we also, we also need some benchmarks on where to compare our resources. And uh, sometimes we rely on experiments. So there are uh, a couple of questions from uh, students online. Maybe I can read them. So I'm going to read a couple of questions from students o online. And the first question is, uh, how good is it to discard the vertex function? So is it an issue that we discard the, the vertex function? This, you're, uh, can I answer one by one? So this is something uh, I think you're going to see in the next lectures. More often uh, than not, it's for all materials I've studied, it's been quite good. Uh, GW has an approximation. I can't remember right now any system and any particular case where the, the vertex was uh, a fundamental part for the correction of the, hmm? the field. Well, but no, for the electronic gap. It's the same vertex. Yes, but a, corre a correction for the electronic gap. The bdsl Peter for optical absorption, yeah. But for the electronic gap going beyond GW, I don't remember any system by heart where it has. The, the aspect is by. Sorry? There are pages by Bonchi. Okay, let's shift. I don't remember the Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. Sorry, I read the other question on the other. Okay, so another question is uh, so the, you made the point that DFT is underestimating the the gap. No, I made the point that DFT uh, does won't give you the correct gap. Yep. And, but the question here is, uh, but besides that, uh, is it the DFT band structure good enough for uh, semiconductors? I mean, when you open the gap, uh, do you think the, the band structure is okay? Uh, you mean the dispersion of the curves, not the exact values, but how the, the shape? Well, I, I can't read the question. It asks, yeah. uh, does it give a faithful band structure, for example, valence band maximum, conduction band minimum position, etc., of semiconductors? Yes, in most cases, uh, that, that's, that's the case. It won't give you the correct band gap, and this is something I want to emphasize, that I didn't say it will give you uh, an underestimation of the gap, because once I reach it, good lord, as I've shown here, this is actually a special case where the approximation taken to DFT actually gives a larger band gap than uh, GW. So it can be system dependent. In most cases, yes, it's an underestimation, but depending on how you actually treat DFT, it can give you an overestimation. Okay, maybe last question. Uh, what is the difference between optical gap, band gap, and absorption coefficient? So, it's so the electronic band gap is the difference between the homo and lumo, so the highest occupied and lowest unoccupied state. The optical gap is the lowest energy at which the system is going to absorb light. This is going to be dependent on the interaction between electrons and holes because once you start to try to, uh, to promote the electron up, it leaves a hole behind, they will interact, see each other, and uh, the, en the energy of this new state will give you the optical uh, band gap. The absorption coefficient, um, do you want a mathematical definition? Uh, I think it's okay. I mean, the, it's part of the optical gap. Yeah, it's so. part of, it will be related to the optical gap. You're going to see it at uh, the BSC lectures later on. Uh, so in the time ordering slide, could you please go there? The time ordering operator? Yes. Yes. So it just shifts all your uh, operators from the earliest to the latest. Yeah. So uh, I have a question there. Yes. Uh, so why do you have a negative sign? Uh, I mean, like. Uh, because they are fermions. Uh, but, like, uh, as you said, I mean, uh, in the time ordering, uh, inside the time ordering. Yeah. Uh, it shouldn't matter, right? You are arranging. No, no, it does matter. So the ordering of the operators matters because I'm dealing with uh, fermions. If they were bosons, you'll have a plus sign. 
they, because this will have to respect the, the Fermi uh, Dirac statistics. I mean, this is not an operator, right? This is what we do. I mean, this is a convention which we define. This is not an operator, right? This is like something it's similar to... It's not a mathematical to... operator on the wave function. Yeah. I, I think the point he is making is that uh, how we we define this time ordering uh, operator, uh, operator, this time ordering uh, notation in, in a way. So uh, yeah, it is defined in uh, in a way that when you zoom. Yeah. So zoom it's there. not a quantum mechanical operator. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, that's true. Uh, it's it's a convention. It's a shortening convention. You, you can call it in, in this way if you don't if you're not comfortable with calling it an, an operator. But yeah, it's not a it's not a quantum. Why it's is it a minus? Why is it a minus? Yeah, that's because of the statistics. Yeah. And actually, there is a theorem that allows you to do all this quickly. There's the Higgs theorem, and it requires that the statistics has to be the right one in order to. So the Wicks, the Wicks theorem, that is the theorem that allows you to expand the, the complex D product in elemental uh, contractions. And this requires, in the case of Fermions, to have uh, the correct statistics. Indeed, in the case of bosons, Wicks theorem is more tricky to demonstrate. OK, I think it's time to move uh, to the coffee break. So we will resume in, uh, I don't know, 15, mi 15 20 minutes. Half an hour? Okay, well. Okay, let's say 25 minutes. <laughs> okay. Ah, yeah, you can go upstairs. There will be something to drink and some food. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, well, I think we can. Uh So...